so today uh, our speaker is Professor Willem Brock. He's an expert in both elementary particle theory and uh, renewable energy. So he received his PhD from University of uh, Texas, Austin, after doing research at University of Wisconsin-Madison and Brookhaven National Lab. He joined uh, the faculty here in 1993, so it's uh, 25th anniversary. Professor William Brock is here. And uh, so besides being a um, world-renowned theorist, he's a um, world expert in uh, energy. He's uh, one of the first owner of Tesla in town. And um, he is, uh, uh, in, uh, in the CEO region, there's only two uh, net energy zero house. And uh, Scott is the owner of one of them. And uh, he, he had one of them in Urbana is um, built from ground up. But he uh, retrofitted his old house into a net energy zero, which is a much harder thing to do. So uh, as an experimentalist, I actually admire him for doing this as a theorist. Uh, so, um, so today, he will tell us some more about energy. Let's welcome uh, Professor Willenbrock. All right, thank you for coming. Um, you see that the, uh, this series is called Saturday Physics for Everyone. And this, this startled me because I thought, if everyone shows up, that's 7 billion people. <laughs> what are we going to do? But fortunately, only a subset of everybody showed up. So that, that works out well for us. <clears throat> All right, but you know, among, the, among the people who have shown up you know, are people who know more about this subject than I do. And so I'd like, to, like you to consider this. I'm, I'm kind of the discussion leader here, here OK? And, and we'll go through, and I, I present, I'm, I prepared sort of a very general overview of this subject. And as we go along, if a question pops into your head, raise your hand or shout it out or whatever. Ask me. If I know the answer, I'll answer it. If I don't know the answer, I'll just make something up. Um, or actually, I'll probably just appeal to other people in the audience who, who, who may know the answer, OK? So let's just have some fun with this. It's very casual. This is not a, you know, you're, you're not enrolled at the University of Illinois. This is a Saturday morning. And we should, just, we should just have some fun with it, OK? So in that spirit, let's get started here. And the, the organizer of, the, of this uh, series asked me to talk about sustainable energy. And then I thought to myself, well, what is that? What does that mean, anyway? That's you know, something we, a term we throw around, but what does it mean? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw at you two of the many possible definitions you might come up with, OK? So, Let's go for the strongest possible meaning of what this could mean, OK? I'm going to claim that sustainable energy could be interpreted as the energy that could support human activities for 5 billion years. Why did I choose that number 5 billion? Why not 20 billion? What's special about 5 billion years? Yeah, I think many of you know that. Our, our friend, the sun, uh, it's, got a, it's got a very, very long lifetime, but it is not forever. And we've got another 5 billion years of solar energy. So um, I put the sun up here for another reason. The sun, of course, is going to be the source of most of the energy we use here on Earth. Okay? But as we go through, I'm going I'm to ask you, is this really solar energy or not? We'll see there's a couple of places where it's not solar energy. So let's, before we go any further, let's first acknowledge that the sun does a huge amount of good for us. First of all, it keeps our planet at a comfortable temperature. Second of all, it grows all our food for us. So, you know, we've got that, that and we're, we're going to ask even more of the sun as we go on. All right, so here's another possible definition of what sustainable energy would be. It would be energy that does not dramatically alter the planet. So in this, in this point of view, it's not really the energy we're worrying so much about as being sustainable. It's really the planet we're worrying about being sustainable. Or, or perhaps, you know, more, more to the point, I mean, the planet's not going to go anywhere, right? No matter what we do, the planet's going to be here. The planet's fine. Human civilization, on the other hand, yeah, right? That's the thing we want to worry about. We kind of like the civilization that we've built up over, over many thousands of years. And we really don't want to dramatically have to alter that over the course of a century, say. So that would be a, a, another definition of sustainability, where the sustainability is more on human civilization than it is on energy. And of course, as, as you all know, we are, 
we are really running into trouble here because every time we burn a fossil fuel, we are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is making the atmosphere a better blanket. And, and we like the atmosphere, it's a nice blanket, but we don't want to, but too much of a good thing is not a, not a, is a bad thing, and we are warming up the planet. We've already warmed up the planet by about one degree Fahrenheit, which doesn't sound like much, in some senses not very much, but by the end of the century, we're looking at about seven degrees Fahrenheit unless we change course. So that's, that's scary. Seven degrees Fahrenheit means that, for example, the green, all the ice on Greenland will start to melt, and over the course of about 1,000 years, we'll see sea levels rise by about 20 feet. And, you know, there's many, many other things that are going to happen that are undesirable. So uh, this is something we want to avoid. So as we go through, we'll also ask, you know, is, is this source of energy uh, bad from the point of view of carbon dioxide emission? All right, so <clears throat> questions or comments so far? Anybody, are you, are you with me on this? All right, so let's, oh, sorry, yeah. Where? Oh, yeah, up here. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the, the, the poles warm the most. The North, you know, the North Pole and the South Pole will warm more than, than the mid-latitudes where we're at here, which is not, not a great thing either. If you think about where all the ice is, Greenland, for example, is up there. So, yeah, that's not a good thing. The, the, uh, the, right, if you think, think about the North Pole, there's a lot of ice up there, right? The, 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 Arctic's, the Arctic Ocean is, is all ice, right? But an ice is very reflective. As, as light comes in, it reflects off the ice back out into space. But when you melt ice, it turns into water. And water is a great absorber of heat. So we have this, this runaway cycle as, as you melt the ice, you're, you're inviting, you know, you're, you're you have more water, and so more heat will get captured by the Earth. All right, I mean, climate change is another talk, right? I actually gave that talk about four years ago here. Um, other, other questions or comments? Thank you for that. You guys, you guys took me to heart and right away. I like that. Yeah? Well, the temperatures have been warming for what, the last 15,000 or so years? Uh, well, 10,000 years, 10, years ago, we came out of a, uh, I guess you would call it an ice age. Yeah, but for the, about, about the last 10,000 years, temperatures have been pretty stable. We've had, we, we, we've, we've come out of something called, you know, actually, we're, we're sort of coming out of something called the Little Ice Age. When I say little, it's quite little compared to a real ice age. But um, yes, there, you know, the, the, but for 10,000 years, we've had, basically, agriculture was invented or discovered, however you want to put it, by humans 10,000 years ago, because that's when the that's when the Earth's temperature climate became uh, suitable for agriculture. Yes, go ahead. Was that? Oh, yeah. And, and so, and we've gone through various stages, advances and changes, of, you know, glaciers, et cetera, which have indicated, you know, the temperature over time, eons or whatever, you know, has gotten warmer and cooler, warmer and cooler. And uh, as I realize the term now, it means the rate of temperature has gone way down. Yeah, okay, good point. So we've, you know, like I said, 10,000 years ago, we were in an ice age. There was, there were, there was, you know, glaciation was much greater than it is today. But, you know, 10,000 years ago, we didn't really have large cities on the coasts of the, of the, of the continents. And, you know, we didn't have the kind of civilization we have today. So 10,000, I mean, you know, humans have been around, the human species has been around for 200,000 years, right? So we have, the humans alone, let alone, let alone all the life that came prior to that, have been able to deal with a, a planet that has a changing climate. But, you know, we didn't have the kind of civilization we have today. It's, it's not so easy to just, you know, say, well, let's just move New York, New York City to, uh, to uh, Iowa. You know, we can't, we can't just sort of do that kind of thing. So it's much more disruptive now. The climate change is much more disruptive than it, than it would have been. Okay, other questions or comments? I mean, look, just, just to, oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, 
No, he, I don't think he's questioning climate change. He's just saying that our planet has, ha, is, is, our planet's climate has changed many times over, over thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. That's true. It's just now we have this advanced civilization. And really, it's a question, can, can we deal with it? How disruptive is that going to be? And I think seven degrees Fahrenheit is going to be very disruptive. So. All right, so let, let, me, let me stop the climate change uh, talk there. But thank you for that. I, I have an engaged audience. That's what I want. That's what I want. All right, so let's, let's talk about the history of energy. Uh, you know, I always like to, I, I love history very much, and I read a book about the history of energy this summer, so that partially inspired me to do it this way. Um, so humans sort of, well, actually I shouldn't say humans because it was uh, our, our ancestors, the Homo erectus, who first harnessed fire over a million years ago for their purposes. Now, uh, so, you know, humans have been using fire, and in, 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 we're going to use a more advanced word here than wood, biomass, biomass, anything you grow. Uh, and burning it for, for over a million years. So is this, is this solar energy? Let me ask you that. Is this solar energy? You bet it is, right? Because if you're growing something, it's, it's because of the thanks to the sun. So this is, this is if you, when you look at a pile of wood like that, it is stored solar energy. That wood was grown uh, from, from solar energy. All right, now, is this, is this an, an, a bad, you know, is burning this wood a bad thing from the point of view of carbon dioxide emission. You know, we, we, want to, we want to try to reduce our emission of carbon dioxide. Is burning wood a bad thing from that point of view? Well, yes and no, because it's true. Whenever you burn something, you emit carbon dioxide. But this wood, the, the carbon in this wood was, was pulled from the atmosphere, or a lot of it was at least, from the atmosphere as the wood was growing. So we call this kind of thing carbon neutral. You grow the thing, it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere, car pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, photosynthesis, through the miracle of photosynthesis, and then when you burn it, you just re-release -re it to the atmosphere. So this, although there's carbon dioxide uh, being absorbed and re-emitted, it's, it's, it's a net neutral thing. So yeah, burning wood is not really a bad thing from that point of view. All right, so, you know, an energy source that provided mankind with pretty much all its energy for over a million years, that's pretty good. Right? That's pretty darn good. Of course, it's not five billion years, but actually, we, we can continue to do this. Why did, why did humans move on to other things? Why did we, why did we start burning coal in, around, uh, <clears throat> around 500 years ago? You know, what, what's up? Yeah, what do you think? Wood doesn't give us as much energy as coal. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, another way to put it is, you know, the, the human population and human energy needs and even the needs of just, you know, building materials. Wood is used as a building material for, for housing and for boats and for all the other things that were going on in the year 1500. Uh, we started to run out. So, you know, people started looking for other things. So this is a, a great example where wood worked for, you know, coal's been around forever, but nobody really needed it. There was no really particular good reason to start burning it until about 500 years ago. So that's an energy, that's, that's the first big energy transition, you might say, um, that happened about 500 years ago. <clears throat> and of course, burning coal, let's see, is that solar energy? Is that solar energy? I'm going to get a demo started while you think about that. Yeah, here we go. You bet it is, right? Because coal is, used to be plant matter. Millions or hundreds of millions of years ago, it was plant matter, and then that plant matter got buried over and compressed, and over time turned into coal. So it used to be plants, and if it was plants, it, it was solar energy. So it stored solar energy once again. Okay, what about, the, so is burning it, it, we know burning it releases carbon dioxide. Is that a bad thing from the point of view of climate change? Yes, it is, right? Because this, this used to be underground. It was stored underground. The carbon was underground. It was not in our atmosphere. Well, it was in our atmosphere, but maybe a million or a hundred million years ago. So we're, we're releasing at the carbon from underground into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So it's a bad from that point of view, yes. All right, so coal, coal, coal was king for a very, very, very long time. Uh, it wasn't until about the eight, about 1850s. These numbers, don't take these numbers too seriously, by the way. Uh, these transitions always happen gradually, but 
But oil uh, came into vogue around 1850. And again, it was like there wasn't really much need for it until, until that time. And so human ingenuity uh, said, yeah, well, maybe we can do something useful with this. And of course, the automobile uh, made it really, really useful. Let's see, is oil solar energy? It is, right? Because again, it used to be plant matter, and you know, it got turned into ter to oil over, over millennia. Uh, is it, does burning oil release carbon dioxide? Yes, again, it does. And that carbon dioxide used to be stored underground. So from a climate change point of view, it is adding to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then finally, uh, around, shortly after uh, oil was developed, natural gas was also developed into a fuel that humans used. All right, so what do you do when you burn things? When you burn things, you can make steam. And let me see if I can bring this up for you. Yeah, you can make steam. And now I'm going to run the steam through a device called the turbine. And let's see what happens. Yeah, there it goes. So this is, uh, this is, this is you're looking at the Industrial Revolution right on the tabletop there. Uh, <laughs> right? James Watt and other people developed the, the, the steam turbine. And once you have something spinning, you can use that spinning thing to do work. Now, those of you who are really observant will we'll see over here, I have an electric generator. And back when this demonstration used to work, we would connect this turbine to the electric generator and it would light this light bulb. But, but unfortunately, we've had technical problems. I think Erica, where's Erica? Raise your hand, Erica. Erica is the king of all these things. Erica has to do a little work on this uh, to get this back in uh, working again. But not so long ago, this was working fine. All right, let me, let me go over here to give Erica some credit. She built me another kind of turbine. That didn't work out too well. Huh. There we go. Is that right? I don't know, Erica, why is this not working for me? Is it working for me now? Okay, forget it. We won't, no, don't worry. We won't, we won't, we won't worry about it. The, if the demonstration doesn't work, we'll worry about it. But the cameras, don't worry about that. All right, so Erica has, has built me a hand generator. Let's see if I can get it to light this light bulb here. Uh, okay. Can you see it? Yeah, there you go. So instead of using my turbine to spin the generator, I'm just using my hand here. Can, can any of you guess what Erica built this out of? Yeah, it is a pencil sharpener. Now, now, for the young people in the audience, you'll have to Google that <laughs> and see what that is. But yes, it, she built this out of a pencil sharpener. And basically, it's a magnetic field with some wires in it. And you spin the wires in the magnetic field to make electric, electric current to light a light bulb. OK, so the whole idea of the steam turbine is just, is just once you have something spinning, you can do useful things with it. You can do work. You can, you can light light bulbs, et cetera. All right, yes? Right, and it's not renewable, right? We can't, I mean, it, it just takes so long to make any of these fossil fuels. Uh, hmm? Oh, bummer. It'll never, it'll never oh, yeah. So we, even if we wait a few hundred million years? Yeah. That's bad news, Andy. I didn't know that. <laughs> Ugh. I knew I didn't like bacteria. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> An alternate definition of carbon neutral. Please go ahead. I would suggest that you're making more than you're burning if you were positive in the sense of the in terms of negative, which means wood may or may not be carbon neutral. Wood may or may not be carbon neutral. What do you have in mind that? I'm thinking if you burn more wood than is being reproduced, 
Ah, right, yes, true, indeed. And, and in fact, we, we have done that, right? The, this planet used to have much more uh, in the way of trees on it than it does today. So yes, we have released, certainly released carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Okay, other questions, comments? Is natural gas, by the way, is natural gas, is that solar energy? Yeah, again, it's, you know, it's, it's decayed matter uh, from millions of, or hundreds of millions of years ago. And yes, when we burn it, we are, again, releasing carbon dioxide. So all of these things are, all the fossil fuels are the same. Okay, so another source of energy is, uh, is falling water. And Eric has set up this nice demo for me here. You know, we, we spare no expense in the physics department. We like to make really sophisticated <laughs> demonstrations. So I have a child's wheel here. Some of you played with this when you were a kid. It's kind of nice to relieve, relive your childhood again. There you go. So falling water can be, turn, can, can be used to spin a turbine. When you were a kid, you didn't realize that that was a turbine, but that's, that is, in fact, what it is. And uh, we've been doing that since, well, you know, the Industrial Revolution basically motivated humans to go look for sources of, of energy. And so falling water became another one of them. Yes? Uh, well, so, so one type and very common type of power generator is what I showed you here as a steam turbine. Yeah, so you boil water and run it through a turbine. But there's a, another uh, very common kind, which is a, called a, a natural gas turbine, where you just burn the natural gas directly within the turbine and get it spinning. So uh, th that, that's called a natural gas or a combustion turbine. So that's another type. Here at the University of Illinois, we have both, actually. In our power plant, we have both types. Other questions, comments? I thought you were going to ask me about the, so this is the Hoover Dam. How many of you have been to the Hoover Dam? I think I was there when I was a kid. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, a, it's a, quite a tourist attraction. Somewhere in Arizona, I believe. Uh, not, not near here, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so is this solar energy? I'm looking at my former physics students here, and former and present physics students, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all hiding. They're not sure what to say. Is this solar energy? Good. Even Paul DeBevick is hiding his face, uh, even though he knows the answer. It is solar energy. It is solar energy. Oops, sorry. The, well, yeah, or, or no, so think about it. So the water falls from the upper lake down to the bottom of the dam and goes downstream. Um, but that water gets replenished. It gets replenished through rain and snow. And the thing that's, you know, how, how did that water get back up into the atmosphere, right? It, it flows to the ocean, and then due to the heating of the surface of the earth by the sun, that water evaporates, gets back up into the clouds, and then comes down by way of rain and snow. So there's a, a water cycle here, right? We have water flowing downstream downhill, and then going back up into the atmosphere via evaporation. But that is powered by the sun. You turn off the sun, and that water cycle stops. So this is a way of capturing solar energy. This is solar power. OK, is this, is this good or bad from the point of view of carbon dioxide emission? How much carbon dioxide is emitted here? None, right? I don't burn, I'm not burning anything. So from the point of view of carbon dioxide emission, this is a, this is a absolutely wonderful thing. And uh, is this sustainable? Could we do this in principle for five billion years? Yeah, we certainly could. There's nothing, I mean, OK, I realize the continents are going to move and shift and all that. But, but, but hydro hydroelectric power, in principle, is something. As long as the sun is shining, you can do it forever. So this is sustainable uh, long term. Uh, now, actually, the amount of water on the planet is not going to change, right? Because water doesn't really get used up. All the water we have now, we had millions of years ago. The water just gets cycled. You drink it, but it comes out of your body in another form, but it eventually ends up being go back to water. So, yeah, yeah, no, it, sorry, at the location, it, yes, if, if, the, if the Colorado River were to dry up, 
you might want to move your dam to another place. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. The your yes. Ah, ah, okay. In that picture, yes. You, you had a quick comment? Yeah, what about all the, the energy to build the infrastructure? Oh, my goodness. Yes, it does take, anything you build takes energy to do. But the, the amount of energy this thing has provided us since 1936 uh, completely dwarfs the energy it took to build it. Yes. So yes, so that goes back to their point, which is that, yes, hydroelectric is a great source of, of, of energy, but if, you're, if your water moves from one part of the planet to another, it may be a problem. Yes, good point. All right, other questions or comments? This is a great audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, right here. Remind me your name. Irene. Irene, yes, I remember you. Concrete, is it a non-renewable resource? Let's see, uh, where's is John Abelson here? I'll have to go to Paul then. Paul, tell us, what is, is, how would you answer that? Is concrete a renewable or non-renewable resource? Concrete actually can be recycled. It is. It takes energy to make it, of course. We've got a lot of it. Okay, so... So concrete, from Paul saying, can be recycled. Uh, and yeah, we have, we're, not, we're not limited in any way in the amount, amount of uh, concrete we can make also. Yes, go ahead. It's energy intensive. It's energy intensive. It all, I know that making concrete also releases quite a bit of carbon dioxide. So it's bad from that point of view. Yes. Ocean, we want, we want to get to ocean waves. I actually didn't include ocean waves in this talk, but I, I, will, I will get there and comment on it. Yes. Um, other questions, comments? All right, so uh, in our quest for yet more energy, we turn to nuclear power. Does anybody recognize this particular nuclear reactor here? Yes, this is our nearby nuclear reactor, uh, Clinton Nuclear Reactor, and... Uh, <clears throat> We've been doing this for, you know, a little over 50, 50-ish years now, nuclear power. Is nuclear power solar energy? All right, well, I, we had someone who, as soon as I asked that question, they adamantly said yes. So I want to hear from them. It takes energy to split the atom. It takes energy to split the atom. Where does the energy come from? Okay, do I hear a dis dissenting opinion? You have your hand raised. So the fuel, the fuel in these nuclear reactors, all, most of them at least, is uranium. And wh where does the uranium come from? Where does the fuel come from, right? And, and as this gentleman over here pointed out, it actually comes from, uh, well, let's just say early, much, much earlier in the history of the universe. So it is not coming from our sun. And so nuclear power, I guess, is our first example of power that is not due to the sun. It is due to something completely different. It is due to radioactive elements, in particular uranium. All right, thank you. Is it sustainable? Can we do it for five billion years? Five, but could we do it? Uh, forget about the economics. Could we, in principle, do it for five billion years? Uh, okay, so it's, it comes, becomes a practical issue, right? It becomes a practical issue. I mean, after all, you might say, well, is, you know, it, it, it sort of depends on the rate. If you wanted to want, let's say Clinton nuclear reactor were the only nuclear reactor in the world, 
and you wanted to run that with, with all the world's nuclear power, uh, fuel, you can run it for a very, very long time. But, you know, we're, we're asking more, right? We have a fleet. In the United States, we have 100 nuclear reactors in the world. There, I don't know. There's probably 400 or something like that. I made that number up. Paul, is that even close? Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, all, all these resources, coal, oil, natural gas, even uranium, there's a finite amount of it. And, you know, at the rate we're burning it now, it is not going to last 5 billion years. But it could, it could last a very, very long time, thousands or even millions of years, depending on the, the type of nuclear reactor you use. What about from the carbon dioxide point of view? Good or bad? Does it release? I mean, it's burning something. Is it releasing carbon dioxide? It's not. It's burning uranium, and uranium is not, does not involve carbon. So there's no carbon dioxide emission associated with this. So from a, from a climate change point of view, nuclear power is a good thing. Andy. Right, of our current, yeah, right. So I, I, I kind of danced over that, right? So <laughs> with the, the style of reactors we have now, but there's another kind of reactor which we, we don't use uh, called the breeder reactor, um, which would allow us to extend that for a much, much longer period of time. But breeder reactors are not being used today. They're not in vogue. And, well, we'll see. We'll see. But even those would not last 5 billion years. Yes? Well, how about geothermal? Yeah, we're coming to that, actually. Yeah, we'll come to that. All right, how about this? Wind, right? We have, we have lots and lots of wind farms in Illinois now. I'm glad I wasn't giving this year, talk 10 years ago because we had none, practically none, I guess. But we, now we have lots. Uh, is this solar energy? Yes. Whoa, you guys are smart. Yeah, it, it is solar energy. You're right. The wind blows be, because the sun shines. So the, the sun is ultimately the thing that, that's, that's powering the flow of, of wind. And so this is a way of, just like hydroelectric, this is a way of capturing solar power. All right. Now, um, I have a demo, right? Yes, Eric has set up a demo for me. Let's see if I can get it to, to, to work. Now, let's see if I can get it on camera. This is the first challenge. Maybe this is going to work, Erica. Let's see. Did it come up? Erica, come, come tell me why this isn't working. Why can't I get this to come up? Ah, I think I was skipping a step. Okay, there you go. So, there, so th that's a good lesson for you. I mean, you know, put, put a demonstration in front of a physics professor, and it's never going to work. But er they always work for Erica. It, they always work for Erica. It's, it's incredible. All right, so Erica set this up for me. It is a wind turbine. Let's watch it. Uh oh. Oh, yeah, thank you, Erica. I forgot to turn that on. So we're going to look and see how many volts this thing is able to generate. Uh, you know, your, your, wall, your wall outlet here is 110 volts. This is not going to get up to be that high a voltage. But it's doing pretty good, I would say, for this uh, sort of crude wind turbine here, spinning away in the wind. How are we doing? Wow, seven volts. Not bad, right? Not bad. All right, so this is, a, this is a turbine, right? It's a spinning thing, and it's got an electric generator in it. And so if you spin an electric generator, you make electricity, and that's what you saw happening here. So many people call them windmills. That's OK. That's kind of a historical term. But if you want to impress your friends, you should call it a wind turbine, because that's really what it is. Um, does anybody recognize it, by the way? Where, where did Erica get this from? Where, where, where might you actually see this in real life? Yeah, on a boat, or a sailboat even, huh? OK. So I, I didn't know this. Erica told me. I've never, I, I'm not, you know, here in central Illinois, my boating career came to a screeching halt. <laughs> but yes, apparently, if you're into boating, you put this on your boat to generate electricity as you, you, know, as you drive along. So that's, that's nice. 
Is this sustainable? Could we, do, could we do this in principle for five billion years? Yes, of course. As long as the wind blows, and the wind will blow as long as the sun shines. So yes, this is truly sustainable. What about from the carbon dioxide point of view? Is there, yeah, nothing's being burned, right? So if you're not burning anything, you don't have to worry about release of carbon dioxide. So this is, this is, this is definitely a good thing on all, on all fronts. Any questions or comments about wind energy? Yeah, right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I was not trying to imply. <laughs> no, right. This is not going to work for powering the physics department. Yes, indeed. We want the wind to come from, from the outdoors, yes. And it's kind of hard to do here. Uh, Anne, do you have a comment? Uh, Paul, the question was, are there any minerals in the, embodied in the turbines that would limit their number? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> there, I know that the, the magnets... Not at this time. How about that? Right, not at this time. Yes? Well, the, the, the thing that we, in the atmosphere that, that is trapping, that, that makes the atmosphere into a better blanket is carbon dioxide. There are, it's, it's so-called greenhouse gas. Okay, there are other greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide is the principal one. Another, another well-known one is methane. The, um, uh, but of course, carbon, you know, carbon's everywhere, right? You are carbon. I mean, organic molecules are made out of carbon. So, yeah, carbon in your body is not a problem. It's just when you die, Please don't decompose, because you're going to turn into carbon dioxide. Okay, so make sure you get buried pretty deep. Other questions or comments? I do want to say, though, people will often, to go back to your comment, people often talk about carbon in the atmosphere. It's just because they're lazy and they don't want to say carbon dioxide. It's, it, they, they mean carbon, to say carbon dioxide. Yes? How many wind turbines do you need to power a house? This will power many houses. And I, I will actually address that a little bit later. Um, yeah? It's not a sustainability question, but in theory, if you draw enough energy out of our windmills, it could affect weatherhead. Uh-huh. In, in theory, if you put up enough wind, uh, wind turbines, or windmills, that's whatever you want to call them, you could affect weather patterns. OK, interesting. I never thought about that. That would be impressive. Um, I see, I see. So we, so we are making a microclimate, to use a fancy word. Here. How many of you, by the way, I mean, we have wind turbines nearby, right? The, the so-called California Ridge. If you go east of here, you'll see the California Ridge wind, turbine, wind farm. How many of you have gone and stood under a wind turbine? Raise your hand, please. Okay, you raise your hand. Good. So... I invite you all to do it. It's a pretty fascinating thing to do. Go, go on a windy day, OK? Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be too windy. It's really kind of a, an amazing thing to do. It's, it's, it, it is. I mean, you know, you can't really appreciate how big they are until you stand underneath one. All right. Other questions or comments about wind? Yes, over here. What about the amount of farmland you're giving up for those wind turbines? So actually, this picture happens to be on a farm, doesn't it? Uh, it's, it's minuscule, right? I mean, the, you know, there is a footprint that you need for the, for the turbine uh, tower. But yeah, you, you're not giving up very much at all. And certainly from an economic perspective, if you are a farmer, you will very quickly realize you're going to make much more money by leasing your land to, to a wind turbine than you are by growing a little bit more corn or soybeans or whatever you're growing. So that's, you know, it certainly makes sense economically. Uh, yeah? Depends on the speed in it. We produce about 1.5 gigawatts. OK. Each, each wind turbine. Uh, that's new. And so to replace a nice-sized coal fire, it's going to take about 650. 650. OK. That's a good number. Yes, you need. You, 
So to, to go back to his point, yes, you need to, to really make a, make a dent, you need a lot of wind turbines. One is not going to cut it, right? Absolutely true. You need a lot of them. Other questions or comments? Well, I'm going to show you momentarily how, sort of how much of our power is coming from wind turbines today. But before I do, I want to just mention another couple of energy uh, sources here. Uh, solar, of course, and we, we here, here is a solar, so-called solar farm, um, right? So, <laughs> is this solar energy? Okay. <laughs> if, if anybody said no, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Yes, this, this is it. But yes, there is no turbine. Nothing is spinning. Um, let's see, Erica, I'm going to try to put this on camera just to show you that I can do it too. But I don't know, Erica, I'm trying to outsmart Eric, trying to be smarter than Erica is a losing game, it turns out. See that? Okay, yeah. I did it, Erica. I did it. <laughs> okay. So the the this is uh, this is sun. We're not going to right. We're not going to power the physics department with this. This is think of this light bulb as being sunshine because I knew you're going to ask me about that. And I've got some I've got some solar cells on top here which are turning that sunlight into electricity and running this electric motor. Okay, so <clears throat> could we in principle do this for five billion years? Yeah. Yes, we can. Right, the sun will shine. We could do it. Uh, Carbon dioxide emission, no, of course, right? no, zero, right, because it's, you're not burning anything. And uh, yeah, so it is, it is a good thing from, from, all, from all perspectives. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to wind and solar. Before I do, I wanted to mention someone, wasn't it you who said, what about geothermal? Was, it, was that you? No, you were the wave person, and you were the geothermal person. OK, so, so here. You know, deep under, under the surface of the Earth, it's very hot. And in certain places on the Earth, this heat comes up for free. This one, does anybody recognize this particular geothermal plant? It's in California. And it's called the geysers. And yeah, so you take that heat. Well, I, I mean, look at it this way. The Earth is making free steam for you. And as we saw, if you have steam, you can spin a turbine and do wonderful things with it. So here, this is a power plant in California that's just using natural steam coming out of the Earth. Uh, to make electricity. Um, is this solar energy? That's a great question, isn't it? Is this solar energy? I claim it is not solar energy. Right, this heat that's coming from the center of the Earth sort of has two co main contributions. One is just, you know, when the Earth was formed, it was the, the, the solar system was a very hot place. That heat got captured in the center of the Earth, and it's, it's been leaking out, but it leaks out very slowly. And in some, some places on the Earth, it leaks out pretty quickly, and we can use it for power. So and the, the other source is that the, all the radioactive elements in the Earth's crust, as they decay, they generate heat. And those elements have been decaying for 5 billion years, and they're going to decay for another 5 billion years. So those two sources of energy are going to be there. And so in principle, this is sustainable for 5 billion years. What about carbon dioxide emission? Is there carbon dioxide emitted in this process? You're not really burning anything, so you're, you're good. You're good from that point of view. All right, but it is not solar energy. And then finally, I'm surprised nobody asked me about nuclear fusion as opposed to nuclear, right? The, the Clinton power plant has nuclear fission, and this is the state of the art in nuclear fusion. As you can see, it is not ready for prime time. This is an experimental reactor in France that's under construction. And you know, even if this experiment is wildly successful, we still will not have commercial nuclear fusion plants. So nuclear fusion. Is that solar energy? Would nuclear fusion, would that be? You have a yes here. Why do you say yes? So yeah, in that point of view, right? The sun, the ultimate source of the sun's uh, light, radiation, is nuclear fusion at its core. So in a sense, you're trying to make the sun here on Earth. 
right? So, so it, it, but it, it's, of course, it's not, if you like, if this succeeds, it's really not solar energy, because that, it's, it, but it is fusion energy. Andy. Oh, going back to geothermal. Yeah, yeah yes and no. And you might so, your reservoir at the rate that we're using those wells? Oh, well, yes and no. Uh, we, you know, the, the number of places on Earth where we've tapped geothermal energy is pretty small. But there's also not very many places. Is this, so this is near surface geothermal, not deep geothermal. Yes. But, well, oh, OK. <laughs> you and I need to have a discussion afterwards, OK? <laughs> I told you that there's people in the audience who, who are more expert about these things than I am, and they, there you go. They, they're quickly revealing themselves. Um, <laughs> ten more minutes. Okay, thank you, Leanne. So, so let me let me. Uh, uh, oh, and, and let me let me just say wave because you asked about wave. So, is wave energy is that solar energy? Yes. Yes, it is. Because you know the waves are because the wind blows, and the wind blows because the sun shines. So it is. Uh, I have not put wave energy on here. It is, you know, it's hard to capture wave energy. You have to put something into salt water, uh, may, maybe, uh, maybe fresh water in a few places. But right now, you know, let's, let's, look at, look, let's look at U.S. energy production. I claim you will see no wave energy on here. So it is, it is uh, speculative at best that we can harness it. So we've got a bunch of things. Uh, I, this, this, you know, this is very complicated looking, but look at the left side here. It shows you our, the energy sources that are used in the U.S. today. And, you know, every country has its own graph like this, but, um, you know, they, and they vary from country to country. But this is, I think the U.S. is a good example. After all, we use 25% we use of the world's energy. Uh, so solar up here, this very thin yellow line, right? Pretty small. Nuclear, yeah, not bad. Hydroelectric and wind, yeah, they're pretty small, but not zero. Geothermal is quite small. Yeah, the big guys, natural gas, coal, and oil. Those are the big guys. Biomass in here, mostly wood. Yeah, making the contribution. So of all the, of all the energy sources we visited today, uh, the ones I've circled here are the only ones that are uh, sustainable at the five billion year level. And you can see those, those five happen to be the five yeah, they happen to be the five smallest ones. That's interesting. Okay, so so we've got a challenge, right? To move away from fossil fuels, to move away from natural gas, coal, and oil, we've got we've got a lot of work to do to replace them. Well, I'll come back to transportation. So nuclear nuclear power here, I've put a green circle around it. It, will, it, it could last a long time, not five billion years, probably. Uh, but it, from a carbon dioxide point of view, it is, it is a good thing. And I'm also going to circle these if you manage to capture the carbon dioxide that's emitted. So if you have a power plant uh, burning natural gas or coal, and you capture the carbon dioxide and sequester it underground, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. We have demonstrations of this in the world, but it's certainly not, not anything uh, being done commercially at a large scale. So that's, again, a hope for the future, but but not not really uh, at scale uh, at this time. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say I'll say something about energy storage a little bit later. You have your hand up too. Yeah. So actually the. I was really, I'm really disappointed that you asked me that question because you didn't force me to answer it. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you for that. Good. Okay. So let, let me let me let me let me uh, defer. Um, and Liang is Liang is reminding me that I'm running short on time. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of move it along a little bit faster here just because I want to get through a few more slides. The um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So. Okay, we have more. And as someone pointed out down here, uh, petroleum is mostly used for transportation. You can see over here transportation, and it's really hard to capture the carbon dioxide coming out coming out of your tailpipe. Um, I guess you could do it in principle, but in practice, yeah, not so much. So, um, 
we're going to have to just replace that altogether. And as Liang already hinted, I, I'm an owner of, of not one, but two electric cars. And so I'll mention that at the end. So I wanted to, to just pause because one of the things you see on this plot that's fascinating is the amount of energy that is used in the United States. OK, don't worry about what a, what a quad is. Many of you know, but some of you don't. Don't worry about that, because I'm about to tell you how to think about that. Let's take that, all that energy and divide it among 350 million people, which is roughly the US population. And let's, let's compare it to a toaster. So Erica set up, actually, this is my toaster. Uh, I was going to give Erica credit for it, but it's my toaster. She just fixed it for me, because I broke it. And again. Erica, why can I not do that? There we go. Yay. All right, so I've got a toaster here. And I'm actually going to put the toaster on the bagel setting so that only half of the burners are energized. Because you only toast one side of your bagel, not the other side. And what this meter, this is called the watts up meter. And it's reading off the number of watts that is being consumed by the toaster. So electric power is being converted into heat, right? Lots of it uh, at a rate. It looks like what? I, I'm going to call that, well, you know, we physicists like to round numbers off. So I look at that and I say, oh, that's 1,000. <laughs> so it's consuming electric energy at about 1,000 watts. Yeah, we're not very smart in physics. We, we have a lot of trouble with big numbers, so we just round them off all the time. So it's about 1,000 watts. And if you take that all the US energy and you divide it equally among 350 million people, it turns out that you use, it's as if you own 10 toasters and you have them plugged in and going 24 hours a day. That's how much energy all of us use. Now, that's not, you know, of course, it varies from person to person. And you should keep in mind that when I say it's how much energy you use, it includes the lights in your home and the heating in your home and also that aircraft carrier that the US is sailing in the Gulf of uh, Iran or whatever. What is it called? The Gulf of Persian, Persian Gulf. Gulf, thank you. The Persian Gulf, right? Because that is part of our energy consumption, is, is things being done on our behalf. So that, that's, it's all in, OK? So because we get bored with saying 1,000 watts, we call it a kilowatt. Kilo is a, just a prefix meaning 1,000. So you, we all use around 10 kilowatts of power. All right, now here is where we live, central Illinois. And this is, this is from Ameren, Illinois, our local utility. And this shows you where our, where our electricity comes from. And remember, it's not just electricity, right? We also consume lots of heat. And usually we're, we're getting that heat by burning natural gas and, and, and petroleum for running our cars and so on. But electricity is an interesting one to look at. Wind power, you know, Illinois has actually quite a few wind farms. As you've probably noticed if you've driven around the state. Um, we're up to about 9% of our electricity from wind power. So that's quite significant, right? It's quite significant. Uh, nuclear power, 16%. Um, the rest is, is, you know, well, hydropower, 1%, OK. Um, Illinois, for obvious reasons, is not a big hydropower state. Uh, and the rest, the natural gas and coal make up about, oh gosh, almost 3 quarters of our electricity production. So let's see, why, why, why is Illinois a pretty good place for wind power? If you look at a graph here, this is done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of where the wind blows in the United States. Well, what you're looking for is purple and red and blue. Because if you look over here, blue, purple, red, those are where the wind blows the hardest. And you can see, oh, the coasts. Oh, yeah, the coasts are great. Let's build some offshore wind turbines. In the United States, we have our very first wind farm off the coast of Rhode Island with five wind turbines. So we've gotten a start on that, but we've got a long way to go. Great Lakes, yeah, good. West Coast, same deal. And then here, the so-called Great Plains. And because nature loves us so much, it extended a little purple finger right over here <laughs> to Urbana-Champaign. Actually, this was U University of Illinois had a discussion with the, with the gods. And we made a pact that they would. So it just, central Illinois happens to be a little bit of a hot spot from the point of view of wind. And, and please don't ask me why that is. It is kind of just a, a stunningly good luck. 
I'm sure there's some geologist in the audience who knows why that is and will come down and tell me afterwards. But uh, So it's actually, you know, now you can see it's sort of central in northern Illinois the best. The further south you go, the wind starts to die out. And you don't really see wind farms uh, south of Urbana-Champaign. At least I haven't seen any. Uh, it's, not, it's not the best place. Um, but the Great Plains are, are wonderful. We can also look at solar resources. And the southwest is the place to be. right? If you want lots of sunshine, uh, you don't want a lot of clouds. And the southwest is a wonderful place for solar resources. Illinois not great, but not bad either. So, you know, in fact, all of the United States, you can get, you can get some solar power. Um, people like to point out to me that the country with the most installed solar is Germany, and Germany would, would love to have as much sun as Minnesota has, okay? So Ger Germany does not have great solar resources, but they still have the most solar installed. Uh, Liang mentioned my house, and here's a picture of my house. Um, I've, got, I've got 17 kilowatts of solar on my rooftop here. And my house is a net zero house, so net zero energy house. So I provide all my own electricity and also the electricity for my two electric cars. Now, I, I, that's a funny number, 17 kilowatts, because didn't I just tell you that the average American uses 10 kilowatts of power? Why do I need to have 17 kilowatts on my roof? Have I gone too far? Have I, have I gotten too, too enthusiastic about this? No, because that 10 kilowatts that we all use includes cars. It includes cars. So this, this 70 kilowatts, that's the peak output. That's the peak output. What do you think the output is at night? Yeah, at zero, right? So uh, if you average it out, even though I have a 17 kilowatt peak, averaged over the year, it's actually producing about two kilowatts. Okay, but that is enough for my house and my two electric cars. Okay, the other, the other eight kilowatts is being, you know, actually I probably use less electricity, sorry, sorry, less energy than the average American by quite a bit. But um, battery I have no battery storage, and I will mention battery storage shortly. I also want to mention, in case you didn't know, that although my house was one of the first with solar in town, when I installed that five years ago, there was just a handful, maybe two handfuls of houses that had solar on the roof. Now there are over 150 houses in Urbana-Champaign with solar on the roof. Uh, and thanks to this program, this is actually its third iteration. And Andy, who's been pestering me back there, is, is deeply involved in this. Raise your hand, Andy. So if you want to talk to Andy uh, with his hand raised, he'll tell you about it. Uh, this, is, this is a wonderful program, which makes the the cost of installing these things very, very attractive. In fact, um, I like to tell people, even if you don't care about solar energy, you may care about money, and this is a really, really good deal uh, for the homeowner who does this. So uh, see Andy or just Google this, and you'll find out all about it. Yes? How many people here? Oh, yeah, how many people here have solar on their rooftops? You do? OK. You do, too. Back at home, nice. We got, yeah, we got, a, we got a handful of people here who have solar on the rooftop. Ten years from now, you'll all have, all have your hands up, hopefully. Uh, here's the university solar farm. And that's, uh, that's of course, going to produce a lot more power. This is uh, almost 6,000 kilowatts. Or for those of you who like the unit megawatts, this would be six megawatts, around six megawatts. There are a lot of panels here. And this is, this is Windsor Road here, so just south of Windsor Road and Neal Street here. How many of you have seen the university solar farm? If you haven't, just drive out there. It's fun to see. And in fact, if you, if you go online, you can find that there are tours. Every month, there's tours of this that are given. It's quite fun to go and check it out. So just go to the university's uh, web page. Just Google it. You'll find it. It's, it's not hard to find. All right, so um, energy storage. We have very little energy storage uh, in the world. And uh, we, we're probably going, if we're going to use wind, and if we're going to scale up wind and solar to become a bigger fraction of our energy production, well, of course, wind and solar are not something you can count on. Uh, the sun may not be shining. The wind may not be blowing. So you want to be able to store energy for future use. Here's a, here's a pretty large energy storage facility built by who? Tesla. Yeah, by Tesla. Built by Tesla. So we, we would need a lot more of that. Um, which brings me to my final topic, which is transportation. So horses have served humans for a very, very long time. 
and about 100 years ago, we kind of replaced them. Well, not in the Amish communities, of course, right? And you don't have to go far from here to see a horse and buggy still in operation today, which is pretty cool. But what most of us are driving uh, conventional cars. And of course, now, thanks to, uh, in part, thanks to Tesla, we have electric cars, not just Tesla, but many other car manufacturers are now coming out with electric cars. And uh, as Liang mentioned, I own a Tesla. I just want to tell you that electric cars are better than you think, much better than you think. If you've never driven one, I invite you to. Here, here's the thing I want to draw your attention to. An electric car is just like an electric drill. Now, I don't know about you. I, I'm not very good at using these things, although when I installed my solar panels, I got much better at it. But the thing I always appreciate about electric drill is how it reacts to you instantaneously. When you press the button, it immediately reacts. It's, it's, you don't notice any time lag. A driving an electric car is like driving an electric drill. Because when you just, as soon as you touch the accelerator, the car goes. It's instantaneous. That feeling is just something you cannot replicate with an internal combustion engine. So I, I really think they, they are wonderful things. And if you've never driven one, please do. But only drive one if you're thinking of buying it, because otherwise you're going to really hate your car afterwards. <laughs> and just for fun, I wanted to show you what the speedometer of a Tesla looks like. This is from the so-called Model S. And over here is the speed, right, 70 miles an hour, which is also displayed here. But notice over here. It's showing you your power consumption. We talked about kilowatts, right? We said we were all sort of using 10 kilowatts of power. This car, to maintain a speed of 70 miles an hour, is actually using about 40 kilowatts. So yeah, so you know, of course, we don't drive our, our cars 24 hours a day. At least most of us don't. So uh, but yes, cars do contribute significantly to our energy use. All right, so I'm, I went over time by four minutes. Liang is unhappy with me. I just wanted to tell you, if you wanted to find out more about what you might be able to do with your own home, uh, Google this, Colonial Solar House, or go to the Physics Department webpage and look under Outreach. And I, I've written a lot about what I did to my own house, how I weatherized it, how I put solar, how I put in geothermal, how I put in LED lights. You can read all about it. Maybe you'll get some ideas for what you can do at your own home or for the younger people in the audience for your future home. All right, so thank you so much for your attention.